I would like to say welcome to you all, welcome to all the guests, those who are following us on streaming. I would like to mention Cheap Family. It's important because Cheap CIA was born by the pioneers, was born by the biogas. The pioneers are still present here in this room, so they believed in what was a pioneering application developed the um, application and this family. So being here today in Rome, more than 600 people is a great result, saying that we are working in the right direction. So our hope is that CIB family becomes bigger, but above all, this action of great commitment continues and also innovative prospects. I think that from the um, concreteness of the earth, we began thinking that if the value of CIB, the values that we represent, are the right values and we believe in those values, well, those values uh, had to be shared. And we had to find a way to share beyond our borders. Because this, is what, this was a test. It's the values in which we believe in our own businesses, within CIB, are shared also in other countries, are shared also out there. This is an indication that we are bringing forward something that makes sense, something that is um, definitely valuable. This is what I'm taking home from yesterday. Our efforts are creating interest, but something more than interest, really, because they are creating some positive surprise outside our world. And I will come to the um, part that um, uh, affects me the most. I represent all the members of CIB, so all the associate firms that contribute to make sure that technology and firms, uh, technology firms as well, te firms in plans have become partners view, partners of all the clients, of all the customers that thought about, um, they generated value together. Today, after more than 10 years of cooperation, we can definitely say that we have attained this goal because the um, connections between the technology firms I represent um, and the um, farmers um, are very, very strong and reliable, and all the operators, all the parties involved have risen up to this challenge uh, with a view to giving an um, important contribution. So this is a very last point I would like to make. So, Piero, we innovated. We were innovators because these approaches start becoming approaches used also in other fields. We started early because the world is becoming more and more complex. And no one can make it on their own. No one can make it on their own. So the systems, the countries that will manage to join forces uh, are going to make it. So. 
uh, setting aside everything that is not generating value, but we have to be very pragmatic in attaining our goal, and our goal is that of being leaders, because there's no alternative. We are either able to become a leader or you're no one. So I think that the goal of uh, the uh, consortium, the CIB, which we want to reaffirm here at Biogas Italy, is the following. Our ideas have to be sustainable ideas, ideas that start from the earth, that start from the land, and give back to the land everything that the land gives us, being aware of the fact that we are still at the beginning of a path. So today and here, um, our commitment um, must be addressed to attain this goal. So at the end of this event, we have to leave this room um, being aware of the fact that we have to um, roll up our sleeves and get back to work and that our future will be built by us and only by us. So nobody who belongs to this family can afford to slow down to slow down the energy that you need to promote our actions. So the hope I have and the wish I'm making um, is to put energy, passion, a pragmatic approach, believing that we're doing something big, doing something great, something that will make our firms become um, um, leaders. And hopefully, Italy will be also um, playing the lion's share in a, in a complex scenario, so I would like to call Piero to come to the podium, so a big hand for Piero. Thank you very much, because he is the um, epitome of all these good things. Thank you, and I wish you all the best for today. Thank you, Angelo. So um, um, I'm, it's always a pleasure to um, hear these kind words um, from Angelo so you understand what's the importance of being close with the um, industrial world, with the agricultural world, so we can exchange views on different um, uh, ideas and um, talking about passion. And talking about passion uh, is important today. I would like to thank all the um, companies that have um, supported this event, that have sponsored this event. Yesterday we uh, talked about agriculture. We're going to talk about a context where there's no um, support system, but the firms are here. At the beginning, I would like to make an applause to the interpreters so that are very good. And yesterday, we heard many people congratulating them. Because we are not used to interpreting, we speak very fast, so um, we would like to thank them again. So um, let's start with the presentations. I would like to hand it over to Claudio Fabri from CRPA, who is going to talk about innovation in the biological process efficiency. I would like to thank Claudio for the work he is doing, uh, supporting the international team, because the work we are promoting that was presented yesterday is the result of great professionalism of our international interlocutors, but is also the result of um, afternoons, days, nights, people like Claudio that love our sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Piero, for the invitation. So the task I was given, and I'm very honored, consists in discussing with you in 10, 15 minutes, um, innovation in making biological processes more efficient. It's a bit complex because after working for 10 years uh, um, in biogas systems, speaking about uh, 
systems, making systems more efficient is a little bit tricky. So, of course, um, we know what a biogas uh, plant is and where we can improve efficiency. Well, we can improve efficiency at all levels, all the levels that uh, are part of making a plant efficient. We're talking about many different aspects from ecologic one to financial ones. Of course, efficiency has to do with the way in which waste is used, uh, efficiency has to do with the anaerobic digestion plan and then in the use of the digestate. So efficiency has got to do with many things. What is a biogas plant? We all know what it is. But I would like to share with you a, a notion which is um, applicable and which we apply to many plants. So this biogas system is, some, is a system that can be planned, programmed and it's predictable because the laws of physics, mechanics, biology, etc. give us information so that we can understand how it works and how it's going to evolve over time. We can get to know it and create models. So this is something that has always excited me um, because um, the people we work with um, with us try to do this precisely. This is an example. The blue curve is what we do. The red uh, curve is what we should be doing. Uh, mathematics and models tell us that if you know a plant, if you know its features, you can predict what is going to happen. So every time we move away from the blue line, uh, the red uh, line go, moves uh, in a different direction. Well, this means that there are some problems in the plant. Uh, there are biological, mechanical issues, uh, and we have to take action and not just uh, uh, be content with uh, loading the plant. Well, it doesn't produce well, we load more material. We can do that, but of course, just by adopting some simple solutions, saying you don't need to be a chemist, uh, you can still apply, implement your knowledge to improve things because we heard yesterday uh, and we know about it the curve of knowledge is growing and so for the future we have to be more efficient so why should we talk about efficiency this is um, um, a chart that has to do with RBP residual biomethane potential. We take the digestate, we analyze how much methane it could still generate. We put this on a chart on the X line. We've got the biomethane production class and on the Y axis of the frequency. So on average, um, what uh, we have to go backwards for a moment. Let's see if we can get back to the pyramid. Slide. So on average, BMP of digested is 90, 90 cubic meters of methane per ton of organic matter. What do we see then? Um, there are the best plants, which are to the left, and the less perform performing ones are to the right. But there's all sorts of things in between. So we have a good knowledge of the system. There are we carried out 200 analysis or tests on many different plants. And this is the average value, the average output, not all over Italy, of course, but just the plants we know, those who uh, address themselves to us, etc. So it, what does it mean from to improve? Well, it means that you improve efficiency depending on the biomass you start with from three Five percent to fifteen, three or five percent to fifty percent. So, reducing. Imagine um, if you had to go on a diet, uh, reducing what you eat by fifteen percent. Well, this gives you an idea of where you get if you manage to make such savings. What is the correlation which we have between 
the hydraulic retention time, so the number of days during which the biomass stays into the system, and the methanogenic potential on the y-axis, we've got retention time, and so the, on the white axis, BMP. So the less uh, organic material is at the disposal of um, bacterial, the more we have a reduction in efficiency. So the green line tells us what happens when in some cases, when we have hydraulic retention that is short, we move towards a change in the diet that increases retention time, or we can apply some techniques, or else we can improve the biological system by uh, changing things uh, with uh, by adding minerals or by applying new uh, processing systems. Uh, the theme of byproducts, uh, uh, nitrogen, uh, effluents from cattle breeding. Uh, uh, so these are some of the topics that we have to consider uh, in our learning curve. The learning curve we talked about when we move towards BDR. So we move away from standardized biogas in other words, producing biogas with a maize silate. Many are doing that. So we move them away from this and we start uh, using effluents from uh, poultry, uh, cattle. These byproducts are full in nitrogen. So if you look at the chart above, we can see here some classes of matrices. On the uh, x-axis, so you get the the amount of nitrogen you bring home, um, so pence per cubic meter of methane, 50 grams with maize up to 250 when you use uh, uh, poultry waste uh, effluents. So if uh, you, I'm sure you are familiar with the idea that What does it mean? It means that somehow we have to forecast, to think. Uh, how much of this product do you need? How much? Red and blue is... Um, what has, was measured and what has been estimated. So you can estimate the amount of ammonium, the concentration of ammonium in the digester by adopting some models and systems. Yes, you can do that. So how can Uh, material from um, a physical or biological standpoint and so on. What I want to draw your attention on Also establish a coefficient. Our plants, on average, produce one cubic meter of meter of methane per cubic meter of digester. So, if you've got stables, you know that the coefficient uh, is very familiar to them. How many liters of milk per milk uh, per cow a day? And this is the same thing. So, how many cubic meters per cubic meter of digester? What is my unit that I have in my bacterial stable is the cubic meter of the digester. Well, on average, we have one, but there are plants that can get up to 1.7, but of course we can also get to two cubic meter, meters of methane per cubic meter of digester. used to a scheme that was a little bit less complex, but 
in the case of biomethane and also in order to improve plant implementation, we have to start thinking about more complex layouts where there are pre-processing systems for all biomass. Well, yes, maybe a share of the biomass that needs it may require pre-treatment. And we may think of load lines that uh, do not force us to feed the systems only at the beginning of the plant to then have this material follow the whole process. But we can also consider that we may, uh, for instance, have some flexibility. We can uh, load at different stages, that we can adopt systems that process material at different stages so that we can make the most of the energy introduced by all these systems in the best way. And the goal consists in increasing unit production in order to lower production costs that, are, of course, are related to investment. The quality of biogas, well, we have heard about upgrading. It's not my topic, but anyway, it's essential. What do we mean to remove 50% of CO2 or 25% 30% of CO2 from biogas? Well, it's evident that I have to consider percentages um, in terms of upgrading capacity. Um, how can we improve the percentage of methane in biogas considering that the, the energy balance, the carbon balance is always the same? Uh, so much carbon goes in, so much is converted into methane and CO2 and this is what I get. But what are the differences? Well, it depends where the CO2 goes. So if I have a tank a pre-tank where I pre-process organic uh, material for to homogenize and mix it, I will lose some CO2 in the atmosphere in advance. I can still captate it and process it because with CO2 you may have some other, you may have biofilters or scrubbers, whatever you want, and, but there is a reduction in the efficiency of the system. Um, yes, this is what happens because I may lose a small amount of hydrogen, but I get to the upgrading stage with an increase amounting to 10, 15 percent of the percentage, methane percentage in a biogas. Or I can add some acid hydrolysis, or I can start thinking, and this is already being done. Uh, for prototypes, in situ methanization, I can use uh, hydrogen directly in anaerobic digester with advanced systems. We are still at a pre-development stage, but still. So rheology and big mixing. So uh, you are all familiar with the idea of mixing digester homogeneously, so you will be familiar with the uh, separation stage, water, floating material, fibers on the top, I cannot mix them. Well, it's a problem because you cannot distribute, you cannot warm up, gas does not come out and the whole system gets blocked. So whenever we have techniques that help us to grind and homogenize and reduce size, the size of the grains, uh, we can then improve the mixing. This is uh, so granulometric analysis, so the separation with sieves uh, of different uh, size. This helps us understand what happens when you start using a very fibrous raw material with more than five millimeters in diameter. If I process it, um, I will then find it um, in at the end. Um, of the process and I can grind what is big uh, to reduce size. Uh, of course this helps but then it depends on how much energy you use and therefore everything has to be very well tailored and adjusted. So what happens when I carry out hydrolysis, acid hydrolysis, it's a process that occurs naturally and always because biomass is first hydrolyzed and then methanized. So what is the idea of hydrolysis? Hydrolysis is that in an acid environment, the hydrolytic phase is accelerated and there is also solubilization uh, uh, effects. But when we talk about um, acid hydrolysis, well, this happens with a pH of five, five and a half. 
methanization in this situation does not occur and we increase organic acidity, which is what is the precursor of methane. When we um, take this uh, acid liquor and we mm, give it to um, bacteria, then this material is rapidly converted, this energy in the form of chemical bonds that can be taken up by bacterial, then they turn this into methane. So what do we do then? We can start thinking of, a, of, of um, an hydrolysis state, uh, a tank of chemical energy that can be used readily in order to um, accelerate um, it can, that can be transferred to the tanks. Why? Whenever we need the flexibility in production. So I can accelerate production if I already have a, a tank of chemical energy that has been pre-processed. I can accelerate transfer. Uh, and so methane production can also be accelerated. So how do we understand all this? Well, we have developed a lab, we have created a lab devoted to biogas in which we have uh, all sorts of devices and pieces of equipment from system to produce methane, viscosity, granulometry that is put at our service. Um, and this is all I wanted to say um, and I seize this opportunity for thanking you for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you, Claudio. And uh, after the, your speech, that was very practical and interesting, uh, and that connects what was said yesterday when we uh, talked about Earth uh, to what we are going to talk about today, uh, energy markets. So Claudio is taken uh, in the, the, the bacterial stable. But now um, we are going to start getting into the details and talk about the um, approach that SC Italian CIB are proposing um, in a roadmap leading us to 2050, the role of biogas within the energy markets. Um, and yesterday, Stefano Bozzetto had talked about these aspects in his introduction. He, he, he talked about what we do as CIB concerning the national energy strategy. And Angelo told us that we are proposing a long-term vision because only if you look to the long term you can actually create projects for this country. I'm giving the floor to Marco Pezzaglia, whom I thank for the help he gives us on these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. It is for me a pleasure to help you out on these topics. Cogliendo anche lo spirito di Angelo. Bene. Il, se parte la presentazione, benissimo. Con questo, Cosa guardiamo? So what are we looking at? First of all, let's have a look at the development of the biogas sector in the energy markets, on the energy markets. But also, what goes beyond this sector. We'll have a look at the data, the peculiarities of biogas biomethane. Biogas is ideally at the center of a triangle, which impacts on the development of agriculture, the development of the territory, the development of energy and the environment. And it's all part of a strategy, a national energy strategy. Of course, when uh, policymakers change, probably that strategy will change as well. But uh, clearly, this triangle has to be part of a strategic strategy, of a, st of a strategic framework of promoted by our country. This is the um, updated data about biogas development. We've got 2,000 um, installations in Italy, total capacity 1,400 megawatts, 80 percent accounted for by agriculture. Over time, investments have been made, considerable investments, uh, 4 billion euro, and at the same time, many stable jobs were created 
12,000. This is um, a rough estimate of the jobs that were created. But we have to be careful here. 12,000 refers to people working in the biogas sector, so own the installations, basically, and uh, subcontractors. It's not the ULA, the annual labor unit. This is a measurement of subordinate employment full time. So not all the people that are employed um, in the installations are employed full time. So if you see different numbers uh, regarding employment, we have to take into account this uh, different sectors. There's uh, eight terawatt hour of renewable energy and thermal energy, which is um, poorly used, but it's actually there, is first rate thermal energy because it's high temperature thermal energy. So this is um, a very important piece of data. What about the characteristics of biogas development? Most investments were made in agriculture. And to be honest, investments are sponsored by the funds that are allocated to the agricultural sector. So it's a sector that has worked very hard by putting lots of efforts in this. On top of this, the uh, uh, Italian supply chain has been developing, developing um, uh, in the industrial sector. And of course, this has had an impact on the competitiveness of the sector in the light of the numbers I've shown you earlier. Another important um, characteristic of the biogas sector, this is just an overview, of course, that will be useful to um, um, put forward a proposal regarding a longer term strategy. So um, biogas, uh, the biogas sector is integrated in the economic cycle of the firm. So biogas has now become part and parcel of agriculture. And then we've got this new concept, biogas done right. Of course, uh, soil requirements uh, are more limited and the environmental friendly approach is uh, definitely promoted uh, given CO2 emission reduction. What are the peculiarities of uh, biogas production? Of course, within the framework uh, of the implementation of a broader uh, energy strategy at a national level. First of all, Biogas is an energy is a flexible energy carrier, and by flexible we mean that it can be used in different ways. It can be used for different purposes, transportation, for the grid, for production, and so on and so forth. It can be stored, and this has to do with flexibility in the short term and in the long term. And so this carrier is a very valuable carrier for the management of seasonal energy uh, uh, of seasonal energy demand. The production of the generation of electricity from biogas and biomethane can be uh, planned uh, up front. Claudio said that earlier. You can program the digester. Uh, given the fact that you can store the material um, that is produced. So biogas, biomethane can be used to generate electricity by programming this generation up front. So um, electric generation, electrical generation can be easily programmed. This, of course, um, suits perfectly the integration needs into the grid of a production set of this biogas. And I'm referring to production meaning electrical generation, electricity generation. But we are also um, pointing out the importance uh, of the support that can be given to um, other sources that cannot be programmed. So it's not actually competing. So biogas is not actually competing with the development of other energy sources. It grows for itself, but it make, makes also other sources grow. And then the gas system and the electrical system can uh, uh, have a dialogue um, 
through anaerobic digestion, di digestion. We mentioned the importance of the power to gas notion, which is um, a peculiarity of the sector. And this is important to launch a longer term strategy. Now, let's have a look at the uh, individual elements of the triangle. We'll have a look at the um, uh, characteristics, at the peculiarities, but what's the um, impact of all this? First of all, agriculture. Biogas and agriculture go hand in hand, and this is a fact. Everybody uh, has realized it. So um, this is the uh, concept uh, on which we are working. Investments in the biogas sector have an impact of national farms, and so they reinform, they reinforce the competitiveness of our businesses internationally as well. The development of new agronomic uh, techniques and technology leads to greater efficiency in their production system with cost reduction to um, further develop the sector and last but not least uh, land efficiency but we have already mentioned uh, mentioned it so since we are late I will try to speed up a little I think all of you are aware uh, of what land efficiency is. The second key factor for having biogas at the center of a global strategy is the development of the um, territory for three reasons at least. The use of heat, for example. Our sector is using very little heat right now, but there are some bright examples of heat use uh, for remote heating or remote cooling, and this must be considered as an option. Currently, heat potential is for uh, TWH thermal. Part is used on the plant, part can be used outside the plant. The remote heating sector right now in Italy is equivalent to 8 TWH thermal. So, we're not talking about potential development. We are talking about what's uh, Right here, GSE um, made some estimates on behalf of the government that uh, were submitted to uh, Brussels. Uh, potential development is um, for TWH for the sector. It means that the biogas sector is not going to use all the four TWH part of them, of course, but. Uh, uh, using just one TWH would mean using 25% of the potential identified by our government and submitted to the government to Brussels two years ago, which is uh, um, not negligible. The third reason to um, make sure that um, people accept biogas as an option, I, I skipped one. I just realized I skipped one reason. It was three of them, and I mentioned just one. There it is. The first reason is local employment, so the impact on, on local jobs. So the 12,000 jobs I mentioned earlier can become twice as many, considering 8 billion cubic meters. So this creates employment, then heat, we mentioned that, and then local um, sustainable mobility. According to SCN, by 2030, at least 25% of uh, heavy transportation will have to be uh, fueled through liquefied natural gas. And um, this percentage might be potentially raised to 30% with the use of CNG. Local public transportation with bio LNG and bio 
CNG. will benefit from from biogas and uh, with the next um, with the next to be passed uh, biomethane decree there will be incentives available as well so we have a look at agriculture we have a look at the territory now let's focus on the environmental system on the energy system biogas in order to be safely and sustainably developed and we will go into the details here but we'll try not to talk at length has to come to terms with the situation this is a pie chart uh, summing up the uh, energy sources using in italy 33 percent renewables on the right you can see a breakdown of renewable energy sources photovoltaic wind which account for almost 40% of that 33%. And combined, it's 40 TWH. This is the electric consumption of our system in Italy, more or less. So those two renewable energy sources are shaky, so to speak, with all due respect. I can try to anticipate how they're going to perform, but the sun is shining when it shines and wind is blowing when it blows. So we, we have to understand what's the current scenario. So. Um, what's the unbalancing, which is part of the regulation? I will take 30 seconds to explain. All production units in Italy are planned. So there's a planning up front of energy production. So somebody is basically anticipating what the power plant is going to generate um, the following day. Well, um, and some of this generation is also programmed. For example, um, power plants are told tomorrow you, you have to generate that amount of energy or today or now or in an hour, you have to shift your production to a higher level. This is what programming generation is. Whereas anticipating uh, what production will be is um, a different thing, of course. If the actual generation deviates from the uh, generation program that was worked out up front, there's a difference. And this difference means that there's, a, uh, there's something off balance. And of course, you have to redress this balance. And uh, Eterna is uh, the one responsible for redressing the balance. The costs incurred, of course, um, are to be paid by those who cause the lack of balance and then all the rest uh, has to be paid by the customers but also between those that cause this unbalance in the first place there's a difference because um, of course costs are distributed based on uh, proportions but for example for um, photovoltaic energy um, there's a margin to consider, a margin uh, that um, does not lead to um, any um, additional costs to be paid. But beyond that margin, they have to pay. Um, and this margin is 49% for wind energy and 31% uh, for solar energy. So it's two digit um, numbers, um, which is important. So it means that this source, which represents 40 TWH, but will matter way more in, in, in the future, introduce an off-balance portion uh, that is pretty relevant on the system. And how much? Well, not everybody, of course, make mistakes beyond that margin.
given the developments, the potential developments that Sen is um, uh, anticipating, the amount of energy might also be twice as much with SCN objective. And when the system is shaky, it is clearly a problem. So the numbers we saw in the pie chart at the beginning are the same numbers that are shared by Germany. Why am I mentioning Germany? Because we will come to another remark now. If the systems are shaky but are connected to one another, of course they will help each other because the inertia of the system is going to contribute to a balance. And this is, of course, um, in a nutshell. If we consider the off-balance um, energy due to uh, sources that cannot be programmed and um, um, energy sources that can be programmed, we realize that Gen Germany is way stronger than us. So Germany. has a stronger connections with other electricity generation systems. So in Germany, a piece of legislation was just passed whereby biogas is used to guarantee uh, a secure energy generation system. So they did it. I'm not saying that we have to do it as well, but it's a good solution. So it's important remarks to make. To conclude, how much is this going to cost for the system? We don't know right now. We have some estimates made by SEN and it's a few billion euro to um, um, set off this uh, unbalance. And we have Turner development plans. And over the next few years, they refer to 7.8 billion investments. 7.8 billion investments that, of course, have to do with the integration of no um, programmable um, renewable sources. And then to conclude, biogas is a key element for the development of a, a safe energy system, sustainable and virtuous. By virtuous, it means that it has to be integrated uh, uh, in the territory. So to conclude, the development of agriculture, the integration with the territory are key factors for a safe and sustainable development of the energy system according to the principles of SEN. That's the conclusion. We are flying high, but I wanted to give you a picture, a broad picture. Then, of course, during the panels, we can go into the details um, of, of this statement. It is important uh, to pursue this development path. Uh, it's not something you, they do on their own. We need to ad have an integrated approach and we need to manage the um, marginal uh, role played by the sector by investing money in agriculture to uh, develop anaerobic digestion and it's important to have a positive impact at a local level. And finally, innovation in the management of uh, electricity generation. In small power plants, but also in some bigger power plants that modulate. It's always a bioenergy that uh, comes from our land. That's the main concept I would like to um, reinforce here. So this is a very important point for the future development of the sector. Over the sector. Thank you very much. Bene, grazie Marco. Questo inquadramento di sistema servirà poi comunque anche nel pomeriggio. Um, so in the afternoon we are going to have exchanges uh, with the institutional authorities and uh, we're now moving on to the presentation by two companies, Techno Project and IB Energy. So I will ask Mr. Moretti to open her works. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning to everyone. I will illustrate uh, present Tecno Project Industriale. It's um, a company that was established some 30 years ago 
and um, it was established uh, as a seared company, seared group company, and it was um, created to build CO2 plants, gas processing, so gas production and processing. In the past few years, CO2 has uh, become um, a, a product that is in high demand and very much debated on. And uh, Techno Project focused its activities on several sectors, including CO2 extraction and processing. So Techno Project um, is a relatively small company, but it is, uh, but over the years, over 30 years, became specialized uh, in this niche, in this market niche. And it is today an Italian company that um, ranks uh, among the top three board level producers in terms of technologies for CO2 extraction and treatment plants from all sorts of sources. Um, so it was a relatively easy step from CO2 extraction from all possible sources and mixes uh, to move on to CO2 extraction from biogas and upgrading, which is, means enriching the um, biogas, removing a part that does not produce heat, so CO2. Currently, the company belongs to Siad Machin Impianti, which uh, is a Siad um, engineering uh, company that produces compressors and air fractioning um, systems. In addition to today, Techno Project uh, for some 20 years has uh, some 20 years ago, uh, established a company in Brazil. We also have some 50 plants in uh, this country. We have another company, Pentatech, which is specialized in analyzing CO2 and technical, and the analysis of technical gases. As far as CO2 is concerned, it uh, deals with food grade CO2. The makeup of the Seat uh, Group, which is a gas production company, uh, consists um, of various companies specialized in different sectors, but mainly in the field of technical gases. Um, the plants that have been installed by Techno Project in breweries or desalinization plants. Uh, one of the uses of CO2 in this type of plants is that um, all salts are extracted, but then the water has to be rehardened, reintroducing calcium, and this is also done with CO2 and lime. The CO2 is locally produced by burning uh, some fuel uh, in a green way. We have a plant in brain that uh, by burning fossil fuel produces uh, over 1,500 tons of CO2 to make uh, precisely water harder. So we have been extracting CO2 for many years and this substance has then been reused in various plants including for instance breweries where CO2 comes from fermentation, fermentation processes. This is normal, of course, in all uh, fermentations producing uh, ethanol. The CO2 is captured and then re-included in beer. So we've got plants all over the world for the main groups, which are Abi Imbev, Corona in Mexico, where we have most of our plants, um, or Eineken, um, and in Spain, Mount San Miguel. So our customers, with reference to CO2, are soft drink producers, so Coke, Pepsi, mineral waters, 
and gas producing companies which then also in turn provide CO2. Gas companies extract CO2 from thin gas from the oil sector. If you go towards Genoa there is a plant that extracts CO2 from thin gas which um, it's a process that produces hydrogen and CO2 is extracted as a byproduct. It is a byproduct generally. Uh, however, we must remember something. CO2 in Italy is uh, quite strangely imported because we don't have this product in Italy and it is imported. And what is produced in Italy is mainly extracted from the underground. So the opposite of what we want uh, to do. So can carbon capture and storage uh, it does, is not so common. And in Italy and in many European countries, most of the CO2 entering the market is extracted from the subsoil. In Tuscany, there are several plants that extract CO2. So even though CO2 is demonized because of the greenhouse effects. Uh, the reality is that we extract it rather than put it in back on t into the ground because there is uh, um, a shortage. And we import between 6 and 70,000 tons uh, of CO2 produced in the north of Italy. It is brought to Italy by truck, so it costs twice as much. Uh, because of transportation. So not only we import CO2, but we also use up fossil fuels for the lorries that have to bring it to Italy. Whereas at home, we would have the chance to extract it from thousands of possible biogas sources. Um, this was um, uh, applied by Techno Project because we have all the necessary technologies to extract CO2. So biogas for us is a mix, mixture containing CO2. The first plants we created uh, were based on uh, amines. Then we used membranes, which are the most uh, advanced technology and which is very much used in the biogas sector because um, uh, it, um, it's a dry process and um, it allows you to manage the system quite easily. So the extraction by using the permeability and selectivity of the membranes with reference to some gases, methane remains within the membrane's tubes, whereas t CO2 and other gases that must be removed from biogas uh, exude from the membrane and CO2, water, hydrogen sulfide, which is extracted in before, uh, permeates through the membrane and its other reinserted mm, into the atmosphere. Uh, or better, as Techno Project does whenever possible, we recover it through a specific dedicated plant. And this extraction, CO2 extraction plant, allows you to prevent uh, methane, uh, the emission of methanes, which is distilled from CO2. And so this is again recirculated within the system. We um, have currently installed a plant that has been operating for something like um, six months. It's one of the biggest, the largest in Italy, producing some 3,000 uh, four or 4,000 cubic meters of biomethane. Uh, it's all membrane-based with a purity exceeding 99%. And it's very scalable because uh, with the three-stage membrane system, it's easy to regulate. And the CO2, which is currently produced, is um, some 80 tons per day. And uh, so we are talking about 30,000 tons per year of CO2 of purity, 
which uh, can be used of such purity that it can be used in the food sector. So this covers half of the amount that is currently imported in Italy for food purposes, food processes purposes. But um, SIAD, which uh, is a parent company of Tecmo Project, uh, recovers all the CO2 and it thought fit of shutting down a plant uh, that had been operating for 30 years which extracts um, CO2 from the subsoil producing some 10,000 tons per year and it was shut down last month so that CO2 is no longer extracted from the subsoil because there it's, it's where it should be going actually. So this is a typical membrane-based system these are polymeric membranes that um, uh, are based on a three-stage system that is patented and that ensures the purity of methane and of the CO2 and it can be regulated uh, rather easily and it produces so bygas is compressed methane is still under pressure so the compression energy is not wasted the methane produced from biogas is no doubt of a better quality compared with the methane coming from Algeria, Russia or the Netherlands and that contains all sorts of hydrocarbons. But the met this methane, the methane produced is 90% CH4 and there's just some residual CO2 that it can reduce as much as you want regulating the system. So very briefly, to give you a snapshot, this is the way the system looks. There's a pre-processing uh, phase for the biogas that has to be carried out because biogas can contains some impurities that can bother uh, CO2 and methane. So these impurities are eliminated by solid absorbents and washing. Biogas is compressed. Um, it is processed um, in this membrane-based system, the permeate, which is CO2, um, goes um, to a recovery system. This is a very basic uh, chart. It goes to a recovery system, which is just the same type as you get in breweries, where um, it is distilled, so instead of extracting um, uh, the air that is left over in CO2, what remains and that cannot be condensed is methane. Methane is stripped, so it is freed through the distillation of CO2 and it is then re-channeled into the system. So uh, there is zero methane that goes into the atmosphere because the gas that contains methane is totally recirculated and it uh, has a composition very similar to that of biomethane. In the plant uh, we have in Italy, this waste is practically zero. The methane is uh, channeled into the grid with no additions and with no need for enrichment because uh, the methane uh, calorific powers are higher than 99%. H, um, H2S is eliminated because it would damage the equipment and it's eliminated, it's eliminated with solid absorbents. It is then treated and fully recovered. This is the selective based system, selective amines, and it's the alternative to membranes in cases in which you have uh, waste uh, heat that can be used. In this case, the first uh, plant we installed some years ago at, uh, um, uh, at uh, a sugar production factory in Morocco. Well, in this case, the goal consisted in producing CO2. Um, cas the customer already has CO2 from fermentation and uh, there was some biogas that was less le left over and it needed more CO2. So we treated uh, 
uh, biogas, methane went back into the boilers and we recover CO2, which is then added to the CO2 coming from fermentation. And as a consequence, because in Morocco there is no natural CO2, this customer currently has doubled the amount of CO2 production using the same system. And by extracting CO2, methane remains just as it did before and it is used again to fuel the boilers. So Techno Project possesses these two different technologies, Amin based, uh, for instance with a low atmospheric pressure and if you have heat. But if you have um, electricity for the pre-compressors then the system used is that based on membranes. So it depends on your uh, or what you have available in order to uh, make the most of the energy sources you have resorting to heat or electricity depending on the situation. This is another system, to the one to the right is a pilot system that uh, was um, um, using part of methane to of my uh, biogas to generate amines. These are special amines that have been uh, patented by BASF, whereas to the left you have a typical um, membrane-based um, system. In this case, it looks like a cam... The, fir well, the one to the right looks like a, a, an industrial system, and this one has a different uh, appearance. It's theoretically simple but then of course in practice uh, um, there is a certain amount of technology involved uh, in its um, usage. This is the um, purification um, system for CO2. So this is a typical brewery system but the inlet is exactly the same. So CO2 coming from the membranes is then processed with or without a balloon directly. If there is a constant flow, it goes to compression, drying, purification, and eventually it's the same as what we already saw, liquefaction and storage in tanks, then sale and use and dark use. So we saw uh, salt plants in Holland where CO2 is used directly into the greenhouses, which is something that should also be further developed in Italy. It would be interesting because, of course, then you would complete the CO2 cycle that way. Here we have uh, a slide showing uh, our, um, our plants. Some of our plants are already operating and others uh, are being built among those uh, that that were built before the last decree was pa passed. The Techno project, because um, it's it does not operate in the field of technical gases. Um, um, it's part of the Siat Machin Pianti group. Uh, can still provide uh, methane liquefaction services. So I think that we are the only company that can start from raw biogas and get to have uh, gases, liquids, methane, and CO gas, uh, liquid CO2, and therefore supply the market with the most advanced products such as liquid methane. And this thanks to the Siat Machin and Pianti technology that um, for over 50 years has been producing uh, uh, liquefaction and cryogenic uh, uh, plants for gases. That the technology is the same, but the market in which we operate needs partners, partners who are already on the market. Uh, and because we are Italian, we looked around and we didn't have to look very far because we found the best on the market, not far away from where we have our headquarters, luckily. So we started a partnership with a company that we believe to be a leader in this market at an Italian world level in treating biogas, um, a company that knows the market well and that can also provide technical maintenance services provide um, plant management services um, 
because it knows the market in which we want to operate very well. So we set up this joint venture, which is called BioChange, and uh, our friend and partner, Angela, is going to talk about. Thank you. Allora, grazie. So, thank you, and I will try to catch up with time, um, focusing on the message I want to share with you. So, let's start with the presentation. Faccio prima di tutto due parole eh, sulla B. Ci conoscete tutti, però eh, così tanto per ricordare. Just to recap and contextualize what engineer Mugumoretti said earlier. Ecco, intanto, quindi, andiamo avanti. Quindi, sapete tutti cos'è AB? Quindi solo per dire... Eh, you know what AB is? Excluding um, the countries that belong to the Soviet Union. It's difficult to enter those countries and operate freely. We are present there from Russia to Western Europe, we are in Romania, Poland, Serbia, Croatia. Then we chose to go to the West, Brazil and North America. AB deals with biogas, and of course you know us for that, but it deals with energy production starting from any type of gas. The main carrier is uh, natural gas and applications in all the manufacturing sectors, so um, chemical, pharmaceutical, and so on and so forth. Tertiary sector, tree generation not only uh, generation of electricity and heat in every form, but also production of cold water for cooling purposes. Then greenhouses, um, fruit and vegetables, especially uh, countries like Russia that are cold countries are using this technology. It's a technology that is um, becoming more widespread all over the world. So a way of producing that um, uh, uh, needs fewer chemicals. So uh, greenhouse uh, applications, uh, 20, 30 hectares um, in, covered by a greenhouse uh, where crops are grown. And of course, we need electricity there, we need CO2, but also we need, C, um, we need heat. So biogas in the different sectors, the agricultural sector you're all familiar with, but also waste disposal. Uh, the world is uh, packed with landfills that produce biogas that must be um, recovered. And then um, food waste and water treatment. And finally, uh, the um, recovery of special gases, uh, mining gases or um, well gases. Um, so gases that also have different components different uh, elements that um, um, through our technology we can use. This is the um, range of natural gas and the different applications, biogas, uh, big or smaller, uh, big uh, or smaller plants, then landfill gas, special gas, then greenhouse and natural gas, of course. We Uh, we um, are going to have uh, an installation in Times Square in New York City. Uh, so we 
are now at the heart of the financial world. So it will be installed in one of the buildings adjacent to the square and it will be visible, even if not recognizable, of course, because it's not possible to have a brand because uh, I think you understand what value this activity might have. But I want to say it because this is um, a great achievement for us. So AB is a business that was born with the many of the people that are here today that helped uh, AB to grow. I said it in my introduction, we grew, grew up together. And through your contribution, we are now employing 800 people. We are present in 20 countries in the world, but we are recognized as a market leader. So the quality of IB, apart from being appreciated by all of you, is that it is um, sought after and uh, appreciated all over the world. And this is something we are boasting of, not only because uh, it's me, but because it, we are Italian and we got there through you. And with your help. This is the choice engineer Ugo Moretti presented earlier. What have we thought uh, of doing? First of all, a step back. We were encouraged by many people that are present here today who asked us, why aren't you dealing with upgrades? The quality service you have provided us so far um, bears witness to a need to embark on new adventures. I'm referring to this as an adventure because application in the biomethane field is a new adventure. It's a new adventure for which we n don't always have the um, competencies. Um, you have all become very good. You are the uh, the ones that know the plans, that know the installations. So from a technical standpoint, you are a source of feedback. So starting from this assumption, we have decided to assess this uh, opportunity. We could start from scratch and start developing te the technology and we considered this option, but at a certain point we believed that AB approach, uh, the one that was appreciated by other people uh, over the past few years, is the role of integrator. So we don't manufacture the engines, you know that very well, it's GM Backer, but there's a difference between a product supplied by AB and a product supplied by G directly or by somebody else. Apparently there is um, a big difference. And so this means that the role of AB in its complete organization, engineering, uh, production, installation and service is uh, making the difference. So starting from the simple remark, what have we done? As engineer Ugo Moretti said, we have um, selected um, a firm in Lombardy, um, uh, so an Italian firm, very close to us culturally, and um, this um, cultural affinity is pretty important on top of the um, geographical affinity. So we thought that their ability in treating gas could be an added value, uh, an added value uh, for which AB um, was not ready on its own because you have to give the market what the market wants, not what we have. So uh, the market needs answers and we have to give all the answers to a market. You can't go to a client and say, I've never done this, uh, we'll see. So we made this strategic choice. We um, uh, joined forces with Techno Project, and as engineer Ugo Moretti said, uh, 
techno project has uh, decades of experience in this field. So they integrated our ability, our overall ability to suit the needs of um, the firms that uh, turned to us. So we entered into an agreement uh, for the agricultural sector with techno project. So um, in agriculture, products will be developed by AB, but the heart I use this word on purpose. The heart, the, the, sorry, the heart regarding the upgrading will be um, the responsibility of Techno Project. This is um, a graph summarizing what I just said. So, how have we approached the market? We always approach the market saying we stepped in. We step in after the digester. So everything that comes before that is the ability of many good partners with whom we have cooperated closely over the past two years, and many are here. I see Michael here, but uh, there are others that are here, other partners um, that have grown together with us over the past few years. So we always said we step in uh, after the digester. We start from the gas. So we start from the gas in this graph again. We, uh, of course, um, take care of all the filtration systems. Um, Ugo Moretti uh, described them in detail. And of course, we guarantee additional treatment, uh, for example, filtration with the uh, removal of thylooxanes, because, for example, for Brazil, we have developed regeneration systems to clean thylooxanes, which is um, a very big component when it comes to waste, for example. But what we want to do is to integrate the plant with all the components that um, make it up. So you need electricity to um, start the plant. So you need cogeneration and the cogenerator will provide thermal energy to heat up the digester. Uh, we need a control room. We need um, uh, a connection to the grid and a number of formal uh, um, uh, fulfillments, so uh, authorizations and permits. So AB is the integrator, as we call ourselves. So we integrate these systems, then uh, CO2 will need to be produced, and evidently Techno Project will guarantee support to this activity. Uh, liquefied gas will be um, the responsibility of uh, Techno Project. So it's a pretty clear pattern. So our two firms contribute with their skills, with their competencies. So the post sale is our responsibility. This is one of the main uh, elements uh, that uh, make us stand out over the past few years. You purchased installations and plans, and then you realize that uh, those plans have outperformed your expectations. It's a challenge that AB has always uh, risen up to. I am the offspring of the land. I was born in the countryside and um, proudly so, so everything that is uh, thrown away, it's a shame. So this is the approach. We have developed a new brand that is BioChange. CH4 is at the center of this brand to say that we are resuming everything that was developed with Ecomax, so all Ecomax concepts will be resumed to develop this product. So we are going to build, basically, we're going to focus on two ranges, 500 and 1,000 square meters, uh, sorry, cubic meters of biogas to think of a standardized product, because what we have learned uh, from the market is that everything that must be planned again uh, has mistakes in it. Everything that is standardized uh, is the result of um, technical economic results good results. So we have to um, make the most of the experience that we have gained uh, so far and make it fruitful for the market. So we'll conclude by inviting Ugo here on the podium to shake hands 
because I thought this was the right place to uh, um, do this because AB was born here and AB will uh, continue along this road uh, to integrate the needs of the system. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Angelo. E ovviamente in bocca al lupo. Thank you very much, Angelo. And uh, Angelo good luck. Kelly just said uh, she's a big family, but Chip is also a part of a larger fam bigger family, that is EBA. Um, we are proudly founding member of EBA and uh, we strongly support the work EBA is doing. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our friends and president of EBA, Jan Stambaski. Thank you, Pio. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the President for inviting EBA to join this conference. In my presentation, I will give some insight into our business, into biomethane and biogas industry, what's the latest state of the art, and of course, some hints on biogenic and non-biogenic biomethane sources. So first of all, who we are, EBA currently is covering practically entire Europe. You see that we are having national members, national associations and companies basically from all around Europe. And now some figures how our industry is developing. This is from our latest statistical annual report which uh, is summing data up to the December 2016. So this is the total figure of biogas plants, so we can proudly say that there is over 17,000 biogas plants in Europe, so you see perfectly decentralized, decentralized energy source with cumulated power output exceeding 9,000 megawatts. Here is in electricity production. Again, very impressive figures and quite steep increase, and now reaching over 60 terawatt hours a year annual production only from biogas. Well, how to express 60 terawatt hours? You can imagine that as an annual consumption of mid sized country, Czech Republic, Hungary, Austria, all these countries are having annual electricity consumption in this range. So it's definitely not a niche. And here are some figures, cumulative figures on biomethane. So of course biomethane is much younger than biogas production. Biogas production on large scale started 20, 25 years ago with biomethane. It's much, much younger now slightly over 500 biomethane plants in Europe. Very important development. You see, compare or in contrary to electricity, you see that it's a really booming industry with two digit increase, percentage increase each year. This is another achievement of uh, our team together jointly with Gas Infrastructure Europe it's a map of all biomethane installations in Europe. It's available for free in our office on demand or a GIE office. Well, it's not only a simple DAO map. You see that, okay, all the locations are nicely seen, but each that location gives the place, exact location, the capacity of biomethane, which is fed into the grid, then the source, whether it's agriculture, bio waste, landfill, or what's, what's the source of that methane, then technology, which is used for upgrading, and then, of course, the year of commissioning. So, in fact, this map is a complex encyclopedia summing up all biomethane plants in Europe. And thanks to our team, thanks to GIE team, available for you for free. 
Oh, shipping costs are think applicable. Yeah, just summing up also our our report. This is not for free, it goes for, for some, some money, but it's over 120 pages of statistical, statistical information. And what I just highlighted, these cumulative figures, that's only the very top of that iceberg. There is a number of data behind this. And now, coming to our industries. Only very briefly, this conference and yesterday we have heard great contributions on biogas done right. On this concept really going back to the earth because biogas industry is the only way how to decarbonize agriculture. It's a very strong message and biogas done right is in fact showing that all what I will show in next slides stands on very firm base that there is a substrate base, substrate pool in Europe which enables us to grow our business, our industry in years to come. There is a lot of substrates, there is definitely not lack of substrates and there is nothing like energy versus food production. It goes in one and that's always point to highlight. On the other hand, our industry is much broader than anaerobic digestion only. We are dealing with AD, of course, but also with gasification and also with power to gas for very good reasons. You see that if we are talking not about only anaerobic digestion, but about biomethane production and about biomethane industry, we will easily realize we are always having something in common. Producing methane, biomethane, and injecting this into the gas grid. On the other hand, we have fairly more things together, and that's why we are working so heavily on power to gas. And in fact, in our vision, power to gas means power to methane. For very good reasons, power to methane, in certain step, needs carbon dioxide, to be reduced by hydrogen to methane. But this carbon dioxide, well, you might think to scrub it from the air. Well, in the air is 400 ppm, so it's very difficult. You might scrub CO2 from some fossil sources, which are very dirty. Or you can use CO2, which is produced, already produced by our industries in nearly pure form and pure streams and use that biogenic CO2, that's also the difference, because all this CO2 is perfectly biogenic in this process and to produce even more biomethane and in fact, in this way, even further decreasing CO2 footprint of that methane. So if this, for example, or here, starting from manure is negative, utilizing this CO2 and green electricity can be even more negative CO2 footprint. Well, why biomethane? Why methane and not hydrogen? Well, for very, very good reasons. Hydrogen might be excellent fuel by the end of this century, but we need something to do this year, next year, in the next decade by 2030. And, well, that's not hydrogen. We have existing infrastructure, we can feed in methane without any single restriction at any time in pipelines, networks, all facilities for natural gas. Everything is ready, waiting. We can start now, right away. With methane, we have 3.5 times higher energy storage capacity. Hydrogen per kilogram, yes, the energy density is high but not by volume, all ga gases goes and are important values per volume, not by mass. With methane, comparing methane and hydrogen means that for storing the same amount of kilowatt hours, in case of hydrogen, we need either 3.5 times higher storage tanks or higher pressures to store the same amount of energy, which of course increases costs. 
than existing and affordable consumer appliances, and especially if we are tapping on transport. And there will be excellent presentations from our colleagues, friends from Iveco later on, using uh, compressed or LNG liquefied biomethane in trucks. Perfect application for biomethane which is existing, which can be implemented right away. And of course, methane is also raw material for chemical industry as a source of carbon and flexibility, of course. Once it's in the grid, we can use methane, biomethane, for all purposes which I just mentioned. And here are some figures how much hydrogen can we accommodate, how much excess electricity can we accommodate in our existing facilities. So let's make some calculations. 18 BCM, that's the annual production of biogas which is used in CHP engines, in CHP and electricity production. That means that we are producing 18 BCM of carbon dioxide, in fact, next to methane, which is used. 1.7 BCM is biomethane production. And if we produce 1.7 BCM, billion cubic meters of methane, that means that our upgrading plants are emitting 1.7, roughly, 1.7 BCM of biogenic CO2. So, in fact, we are talking about roughly 20 billion cubic meters of CO2 available for methanation reaction, which can simply, the stoichiometry is 4 to 1, can accommodate up to 80 BCM of hydrogen, which is tremendous amount, which could accommodate nearly 400 terawatt hours of electricity, which is amount comparable to annual consumption in country as big as France. So you see, there is no such electricity excess yet, and if there would be, we can accommodate this excess with our existing facilities. That's a strong message. Our industry, every single biomethane, biogas plant can be equipped with this technology and can help in electricity grid stabilization and also increase efficiency of our industry and to decrease CO2 footprint of our existing facilities. Well, some people, when hearing this, might say, well, in that reaction, it's one, one step further. It's not ending with hydrogen. Then you have to process hydrogen, make methanation of CO2, and you lose some efficiency. What about efficiency? Well, that's true. On the other hand, some waste heat is lost directly in hydrogen production, and some energy, but see, it's less energy, is lost in methanation reaction. Well, but we are working with anaerobic digestion mostly. And this low potential heat can be perfectly utilized in anaerobic digestion to heat up the fermenter or to couple this heat source with some upgrading technologies. So this heat is definitely not lost. And thanks to that, we can gain another 10 percentage points of efficiency. That means that conversion or storing electricity into methane goes then not with 60 to 65, but 70 to 75 percent efficiency. And then, of course, synergy in process integration. As I just mentioned, methanation produces heat, which can be integrated. Then also biological power to methane can be integrated virtually in any biogas plant. With gasification, this can be pushed even, even further because we are talking about at least one order of magnitude higher capacities and higher values. And as I already mentioned, carbon efficiency dramatically increases for, for our, our product because all biogenic carbon, and imagine that we are planting biomass, which is in fact quite expensive. It's precious source. And we are converting that into some gas, methane and CO2. 
and this CO2 nowadays is lost. If it's utilized, if it would be utilized, then we are increasing carbon efficiency of the process, utilizing up to 100% of carbon which has been harvested from the field. And this is also showing the entire concept. In fact, we are talking about carbon-based battery. Well, fully charged battery is expressed as methane. Fully depleted battery is expressed as CO2. With unlimited number of cycle of charging and recharging. And of course, I really would encourage you to Google term lithium mining and the pictures, what you will get when looking for such a term. Definitely exploiting carbon from the atmosphere is much nicer than exploiting lithium from the earth. And of course, to realize this, we need very strong cooperation. One of the major activities in these days, gas for climate, but I will leave this uh, up to our colleague Kess, uh, which will follow in the next, next presentation. And of course, ERGAR, European Renewable Gas Register, which is a tool enabling and which will enable international market and trade with biomethane. Because it doesn't really matter whether your product is a mobile phone or natural gas or biomethane. You need large market, not 27 fragmented markets, but one single market. That's in fact the very core of the EU project idea, but so far we do not have common market for biomethane. Ergar is a tool to make this common market. And of course, to enable all things which I just mentioned all that volumes to be market be marketed because that's not quest for one single country. Well, conclusions, biomethane industry is very strong and major partner for green electricity. That's, I think, the major, major message here because if there is any excess of electricity, there are existing technologies how to deal with that and how to perfectly incorporate this into our existing industry. Power to methane can be much quicker and much cheaper than trying power to hydrogen in next five years or next decade. As I already mentioned, hydrogen might be the goal and might be the final thing in the end of this century. But if we are talking, and uh, we have heard yesterday from Bruce Dale excellent contribution that the action is needed now. If the action is needed now, well, let's forget hydrogen. That's definitely not thing for tomorrow. Yeah, and then the last one, with all these improvements in technology, we are supporting our existing industry. Power to methane, it's not someone else. Power to methane is a thing which will be implemented in our existing plants. It will be your future business. Right, that's all, and I really thank you for your attention. Okay. Anche sul gradino era troppo. <laughs> thank you, Jan. We've got a lot of work to do in Brussels, so I'm sure we will do in the ne next future. Um, passiamo un'altra esperienza aziendale. Eh, Vi chiamo un'altra esperienza di pratica tecnica. Let's move on to another practical experience. I'm very pleased to present the person who is going to take the floor. Um, he has been helping us within EBA. Not only Stefano Bazzetta is a, a, Bozzetto is a board man, a member, but um, Michael Niederbacher is also a member. Presenting Michael means presenting a small piece of the history of biogas in Italy. So it's a pleasure for us to have you here. Thank you, Piero. It's too great an honor. I would like to thank you. Eba, perché dobbiamo dire che abbiamo. Well, to thank EBA because we have a bright future ahead of us. But the question is, when are we going to start? 
We have started with the numbers already. But I said yesterday, if we have to do cubic meters, We don't have to change pace, but we have to change machines as well. Adesso siamo pronti, lo facciamo vedere. We have to wait for some political decisions, not only in Italy, but also abroad. Oggi vi presento una cosa. Io innanzitutto volevo prima presentare forse un po'. So I wanted to present the things we have developed together over the past few um, years, thanks to everybody, especially our clients, that had uh, trust in us. Um, because innovation is very important, of course, but there are many other things to consider. What I was asked to present today, and I'm very happy, because as Jan said, I'm, I'm very happy because, of course, I can go into the details and I will focus on the power to gas. This is a feasibility study financed by the uh, province of uh, Bolzano, and you will find uh, slides from Sudtirol. This province, this province developed um, a lot, but it also has uh, problems um, to address. We do biogas, biomethane um, uh, plants, 120 um, workers that want to be paid every month. And we have a cooperation in China. We export Italian technology to the Asian world. Elon Musk, Tesla's boss, says that these points here could provide primary energy, not only uh, electric energy all over the world, it's a surface of 500,000 square kilometers. So everything is possible. The only problem is how to store it. And as Jan highlighted, and I'm very happy with that slide, he showed a lithium, uh, lithium vis a vis coal. But there are many smart grids. Condensers, batteries, lithium batteries, power to heat, power to cold. So we can also um, have heating with electric energy if we got too much because um, uh, CO2 emissions are higher than power to gas. So it's a um, um, coal battery. Now a few slides to ex explain the problem. In Sutirol, we have um, uh, production 95% is um, hydroelectric energy. Of course, so we are in the mountains with the seven wharfs, so 200% of electric consumption. Uh, so if all these will exit the feed-in tariff, what's going to happen with this energy? Because maybe it's a commodity that um, it's not that necessary in, in that proportion, and so only 50% from renewable sources. We have 77 remote heating uh, plants, more than 50% of households use remote heating, and there's a big number. Our houses are more and more isolated, so energy consumption goes down, electricity consumption goes down. So that spiral is spiraling down. Of the 77 systems, two-thirds have big problems, big economic problems. They've got public funds, and now they have to survive. They can't fail. How can they get out of this stalemate? We uh, try to produce biofuel then to help them. Then 33 biogas plants. No Italian boom in Sutirol because uh, there's still a tremendous potential to exploit 15,000 cattle. So we are pretty small. So 
So electricity is all from renewables. One third heat is renewable, two thirds still fossil, and transportation still fossil fuels, all, almost all of it. From in 2014, uh, a first, a f the first H2 station was um, opened in Italy. There's electrolyzers, there's three machines, 500 kilowatts each. They produce 300 kilos of hydrogen a day. 20 buses uh, in, in, in boats and that are hydrogen fueled and 30 cars. It's a start, but 17 million um, for the plant and 1 million for the station. But uh, the costs have been uh, going down, uh, 800 uh, euro per megawatt, and now it's 400 euro per megawatt. And that's the uh, purpose. We also have biomethane, 2.2 million and uh, NM, so uh, one uh, megawatt equivalent plan could um, uh, also fuel methane stations. Uh, this, we have more than one million uh, cars in Italy that are methane fueled. We are ranking fourth in Italy. Iran is number one. But 30% of public transportation is already fueled uh, with natural gas. I will briefly explain our project. It's a feasibility study in cooperation between BTS, Sineco, the uh, uh, Foundation Edmund Mach, and uh, ITT and electro archaea that do the biological uh, organic methanization. So what's the um, idea of the basis of this project? Starting from a biogas or a syngas plant or the combination of the two to uh, achieve this power to gas. How does it work? Uh, here we've got everything, so all, all um, crops waste, um, slaughtering waste, we produce a syngas, and this is where methanation takes place. Uh, gas enters, these are the columns. Uh, it's very, it was very simple. It does uh, electrolysis. The um, hydroelectrical energy from Sutro to produce methane. Let's uh, consider an example. This is a one megawatt plant. Only um, livestock effluents are used. I'm a son of farmers, so um, I think it's clear what's been done here. What we did here, it can't, can't be done in other sectors. A hundred or two hundred farmers um, in a cooperative is not easy to achieve, but it's working very well. This is uh, the gas, the dry gas. 56 methane, 37 CO2 nitrogen, because we do desulfurization. This is another plant. It's a 1.2 megawatt plant in, in Switzerland. So it's, it's very close to Luzern. This is a remote heating uh, plant, 5 megawatts, and the gasifier. Capacity is 500, 558 kilowatts. A syngas is a special gas. This is the gasification. I won't explain this because I think it's a reactor with two engines to increase the yield um, of the gas. It's already 75%, so it's pretty high. So even the organic yield of the biogas plant is um, is pretty high. With the biogas, we can, um, of course, improve even further. This is a new reactor we have developed to improve the quality of gas. This is the 
rough gas, this is the uh, crude gas, this is the clean gas, these are the ashes. If I don't see coals in here, coal in here, the means that the yield of the gasifier was very high. So what comes out of it? First of all, nitrogen, because air is the combust combustion medium. C uh, O 22 percent, C O 2 11 percent, hydrogen 17 percent, methane 1.5 percent, pretty low. But if I use not air as a combustion medium, but oxygen, ex oxygen from the electro electrolyzers, I can reduce nitrogen to zero and have 30% of hydrogen, which is a, what I want to achieve. So the CO, which accounts for 33%, I'm not an expert here. I spoke to a few farms here, very good, with CO plus H2O, I can produce hydrogen. So I don't know this process. I have hydrogen, 55%, CO2, 40%, methane, 5%. So it means that if I do the methanation of this hydrogen with this methane, 35% of CO2 already could be translated into methane, transformed into methane. This could be a, an option because uh, syngas is, uh, is tricky. The air filter, uh, of course, can be damaged. I can produce methane, which is the molecule we want to obtain. Then the idea is combining biogas plus syngas for the organic methanation. This is the process. This is the chemical formula. CO2 plus 4H2 equals uh, CH4 plus 2 H2O. And I have heat that can be used in the biogas plant to heat up the tanks. Electro Achaea has already built a plant in in Denmark. I was there, uh, I saw it. They have bacteria, archaea, that have methanation, CO2 electrolysis, they have one um, uh, megawatt electrolysis machine, and the net reaction is CO2 plus um, uh, Two for um, two H two O plus oxygen plus heat, and that's the idea. So the power to gas is the missing link. So as Jan said, we want to store that gas uh, to complete the circle. So to go in the other direction, this is the plant in Denmark, which is running. Has been running since 2015, I guess. One. Uh, megawatt for electrolysis, 200 square uh, cubic meters of hydrogen, 50 of CO2, because there's a purification plant of wastewater, so the biogas plant. And this is 75 square meters, cubic meters is already methane, which needs no change, no processing. From 50 cubic meters of CO2 and 200 of hydrogen, I can have uh, additional 50 cubic meters of methane plus uh, 320 kilowatts of heat. This is um, the plant that is working very well in Denmark, as far as I understood. So example, if we take one megawatt biogas plus 200 kilowatts of gasifier, we obtain water for the water shift, but we have three megawatts of energy value with 655 nm uh, of m mixed gas, this mixed gas, hydrogen 18%, methane 40% plus 40%. And I should add to that hydrogen with an electrolyzer of electrolysis equipment of 5 megawatts, these 5 megawatts of course, allow us to use electricity when he, uh, the cost is lower. So I do methanation from 7.7 .7 megawatts. I inject 5.2 megawatts uh, of combined cycle come out. So the yield is 66, 67 percent. So it means one third is lost because of the heat. 
But at the end of the day, I have methane that can be almost ready to be injected into the grid. So what are the open questions? Um, things that we're trying to understand from this feasibility study. We have to compare direct methanation with um, uh, upgraded CO2 methanation. This is the question mark. So what, what's best? Second, water shift, that water shift. Um, I have to ask other firms that are more competent than myself, but um, uh, I'm not sure this can be done. Then increase the concentration of hydrogen, because if I could uh, obtain um, hydrogen, I wouldn't have to use electrolyzers that much, but only what I actually need. Then we have to understand the tolerance of uh, bacteria, the archaea, ammonia, for example, or tar. We are carrying out a few tests in laboratory. And then to define post-treatment, so um, how the gas has to be treated. If it can be injected right away, or if we have to use other upgrading technology. But maybe that won't uh, won't cost much. And the last but not least, OPEX and CAPEX. If we can uh, make some money out of it, because uh, safety environment without um, getting any money out of it is not uh, a viable option, unfortunately. What are we doing? We are carrying out tests in a laboratory with uh, the Mac Foundation. We have to adapt this visibility study because it's not over yet. This is um, an interim report. We're going to finish that in two or three months. So we have to adapt this visibility study to the market and to the conditions we have, uh, costs of electricity and uh, all the things that are not clear yet. And we have to implement a project. We have to implement this project to show that with a biogas plant alone, or with a syngas plant alone, or with a combination of the two, we can um, have this uh, core battery we have referred to earlier. I will conclude with this, so thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you all the best. Thank you for your presentation. You talk not just about the past, but also the future. A partnership. Uh, we started working with Ecofis two years ago. Last year, here in Biogas Italy, we presented an assessment that Ecofis has been uh, following uh, on the sequential coping. Ecofis is an uh, independent environment, environmental uh, uh, consulting company. So. It's a pleasure for us to have uh, Kiss van der Loon here, also because uh, he's tweeting a lot <laughs> and he's uh, one of the most influenced pe people in, uh, in environmental uh, ideas in, uh, on, on the social. So thank you, Kiss. Thank you, Piero, for those uh, kind words. Uh, actually, it was via Twitter that I got to know the Consorzio Italiano Biogas. I was just uh, scrolling back and uh, my first contact was with uh, Stefano in 2014 when he began to challenge me on uh, several assumptions on, on the energy system and to point out uh, the role that, uh, that farmers could play, that agriculture could play. And uh, this has uh, developed into a, a wonderful cooperation. Very much appreciate being here with you and uh, yeah, being part of this uh, exciting development. What I'm going to uh, talk about is, uh, is gas for climate. It's work that we do for a, for a group of companies that I will introduce shortly on the role that gas in general and, uh, of course, low emission gas can play in the future energy system of Europe. Because that's the topic that I've been working on for the past 32 years in, in ECOFIS. And I think uh, biomethane, biogas done right, they all fit in uh, very well there. And it's also the topic of this, this presentation. First, uh, let's start with, with the climate, because uh, 
I know that uh, keeping uh, Stefano busy is keeping many of you busy, is keeping me busy. Here we see a diagram of the temperatures. Uh, in the middle is pre-industrial level, and you see them over the months as a clock, um, growing and growing in the direction of these, uh, these limits uh, where stuff can really uh, become very difficult at 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. So one more time, you start in the 1800s, very close to the pre-industrial temperatures, and you see the monthly values as a clock uh, developing uh, and, and starting to grow and actually accelerating. So it's, it's about time that we bring our emissions to zero. And that's, uh, that realization is sinking in over the, the past couple of years, and it's greatly helped by the, by the Paris Agreement. Because uh, this was a highlight, uh, end of 2015, when 195 countries agreed to keep global warming well below 2 degrees and to even strive for 1.5 C, which, as you've seen from the diagram, is a heck of a challenge by now. Studies show that to meet these targets, we need to go to net zero carbon emissions around 2050. In the diagram, you see uh, the business as usual, as we were developing over the past couple of decades. You see the red line showing the commitments of the countries uh, now into the Paris Agreement, which is basically to stabilize CO2 emissions. You see it happening at the moment. But uh, reality is that we now have to go rapidly down. There's already too much CO2 in the atmosphere. Every uh, ton of CO2 uh, that we uh, pour into the at atmosphere is one too much. So the, the green line shows a two degree scenarios and the blue line uh, a rough indication of where the 1.5 degrees or the well below two degree scenarios would be. And this implies, of course, that we need to fully decarbonize uh, the European energy system. And that's why we're very happy uh, that this group came together. Um, it's, uh, the Gas for Climate Consortium consists of seven gas TSOs, so the gas transport companies of Italy, uh, because this project started with SNAM as one of its originators, of Spain, uh, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. And we work together with uh, the CHIP, uh, the Consorzio Italiano Biogas, and the European Biogas Association to develop and communicate a vision on the role that gas can play in decarbonizing uh, this European energy system. ECOFIS supports that work um, with the quantification, uh, with the analysis, with uh, helping to de develop that vision, helping to communicate it, especially also in Brussels, in view of the long-term policy. What we see in, in the debate is that there's a lot of focus on electrification. You always hear about uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, great developments in solar PV and how uh, batteries will help uh, make that applicable uh, throughout the year. Uh, but the reality is that, um, that, there, that that's not going to get, get us there at an affordable cost and in time. Uh, at the same time, uh, gas is often re regarded as a transition fuel. It has also been ad advertised a lot as a transition fuel, so that's a logical thing. But it's now uh, about time uh, for the gas industry uh, to develop this vision on, okay, how does this whole thing fit together? And how can we uh, make uh, the energy system work in the best possible way? And that's what we're after. And there uh, we find that there are three, what I call, sweet spots for gaseous energy carriers in the energy system of the future. First of all, dispatchable power. You, don't, you can't only build your power system on wind and solar. You need also dispatchable sources. I'll go into these in, in a little bit more detail. Second, uh, supporting the heating of buildings in cold spells when it gets really cold and when you don't have enough electricity to go around. And thirdly, in industrial applications where we of course need gases to build our uh, molecules. Firstly, about that dispatchable power. Uh, in the graph you see a, a pattern of electricity generation in Germany in January of last year. 
Uh, you see the gray, that's still conventional power generation. You see a lot of green, that's wind power. And you see not a lot of uh, yellow because it's winter and uh, Germany is at 50 degrees latitude and more. So there's not a lot of uh, solar energy to go around. So you become rather dependent on the wind. And uh, you, you can see here that in the second week there's still a lot of wind. But in the third week of January it was gone. There was a high pressure area. And these are uh, the, the weeks that we really need uh, gases uh, to, to make the system work. Of course, there are other solutions. You can do a lot with demand response. You should use less electricity when supply is tight. You can uh, store electricity, but that's in batteries is more for day-night storage than for longer term. Uh, you can uh, even out uh, situations by interconnections so that other countries can supply you uh, when the supply is tight. But in the end, you also need dispatchable power generation. And here, there's a big advantage for gas-fired units. We've known them for a long time. They have a low cost of capacity, uh, which is a very good thing because they are not, will not be running for that many hours every year. They have a high flexibility. They can ramp up and down very quickly. And of course, when you use biomethane, uh, they can be zero emissions. So they can be the perfect complement to wind and solar in power generation. The second sweet spot, these cold spells. Um, a lot of future heating solutions for buildings, and they are being implemented already, uh, have electric heat pumps as a component. Electric heat pumps are really nice because they can take a lot of ambient heat, uh, bring it to the required temperature level with a modest amount of electricity. But they will, of course, add to electricity demand, as you see in the, the green part of the bar there. But the difficult situation is when it gets really cold, because then you need a heck of a lot of additional electricity, which is the red part. And you can't always get that from the neighbors, because in the map of Europe, you see uh, the last big cold spell that we had in Europe in 2012. Uh, and you see how widespread it is. It's, it's uh, abnormally cold over large parts of Europe. So it's not the case that, oh, uh, in our country it's cold, so we'll get the electricity for our heat pumps from the neighbors. So what can we do to mitigate this uh, very high electricity peak demand in cold spells? Of course, it helps to have systems with renewable district heating that can take par part of the buildings and that don't contribute to these peak problems. Of course, we need high quality heat pumps. Some heat pumps are really poor. They po perform poorly when it gets really cold. The uh, efficiency even goes down and they uh, exacerbate the peak problem. But in the end, we also need hybrid heating solutions uh, where we make use of the fact that there are gas grids, that there are fine maize distribution gas grids in large parts of Europe, especially where the heating demand is high. So why not keep those and use them when it gets really cold? So that is the second sweet spot for gases in the system without CO2 emissions. And then thirdly, industrial applications. Um, Jan has already talked about hydrogen from electricity. Uh, others have done so. Uh, also possible to make uh, methane from that hydrogen. And uh, we will need to see how that develops. There's, of course, a lot of existing uh, methane infrastructure, so I see your point there. But, for example, start at the left, steel production. We now uh, use cokes for that and coal. Thermal coal and cokes uh, are used in the steel production. But it's also possible to produce steel from iron ore uh, using hydrogen. So that's a direct use of hydrogen in the future. And if we can make that hydrogen from renewable electricity, that's very favorable. Then in fertilizer plants, and uh, if biogas done right uh, uh, grows and grows, then we will have less of those probably. But fertilizer plants uh, use a lot of hydrogen as well. And you could get that uh, from renewable electricity too. And finally, we of course have our chemical industry. And it needs gases. Uh, for example, methanol is an important building block in the chemical industry. Uh, it, it now uses fossil methane, so fossil gas, natural gas. That could be biomethane as well. 
But you, from the other hand, you could also uh, work, uh, combine uh, hydrogen from renewable electricity with CO2 from your biogas plants. So there are many options to uh, decarbonize the chemical industry using these gases as well. In our study, uh, and the results will be published later this month, so I cannot uh, unveil all kinds of detailed numbers, but we've looked at the potential for renewable gas in Europe in 2050 and what this, using this in the right way in these sweet spots could save to society. How many uh, euros, billions of euros are being saved when you compare it to uh, trying to solve the whole equation without gases in the system. And then, first of all, uh, the biomethane is the big chunk in uh, the potential for uh, zero carbon gas. Um, it's over 100 uh, BCM for Europe, and uh, we, will, uh, we will disclose the, uh, the results of the study uh, when it's published later this month. And then uh, the hydrogen is, uh, in the present estimations, a smaller chunk, but it also adds up to this, uh, to this uh, renewable gas that can become available in the system. And mind you, it's not there yet. We need to grow the industry a lot to make this come true. And then what, will, what can you achieve? You can achieve cost savings of over 100 billion, and that should be 100 billion per year. So that's very important for European economy and for European households. If you compare it to options where you try to solve it, uh, for example, the heating with all electric, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, just in the in the buildings, uh, and uh, yeah, actually, just in the buildings and heatings, you you already get enormous savings. You you, you uh, save on electricity infrastructure, but also on rever uh, reserve capacity, etc. etc. Then, of course, there's the improved security of supply. Uh, much of this renewable gas can be produced within the EU. Uh, it, uh, on the one hand, it increases the redundancy. If you have two sources for your energy system, that's more reliable than if you only have electricity. But it also reduces dependency on imports. And finally, but I don't have to tell that here, uh, it uh, it's, can contribute to a stronger rural economy. It can uh, contribute to the economy of farms, which is, of course, essential for our sustainable future in Europe. What needs to be done uh, to get there? And that's what we're working on at present. Uh, of course, uh, investment should be brought in line uh, with this development, with the long-term role of gas in the energy transition. It is an enormous challenge, and we'll need all kinds of technologies. And uh, therefore, we should not exclude uh, technologies either. Um, about investing in gas infrastructure, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about that also with the NGOs. We think that that shouldn't be stopped, but uh, we should just check that the investments that are still being made fit with, with this kind of a vision in the direction of a zero emission European economy. And then what we would love to work on and what we've already started to work on with the group in 2018 is a roadmap. So first of all, break through, through uh, some barriers, then continue uh, the dialogue, refine the vision, come up with also short and medium term implementation strategies, because it's very nice that we now have a picture for 2050. But the debate in Brussels is, of course, more about 2030. And many investments are also made on a shorter time scale. So we need to come up with a roadmap to define the actions at long, medium and short term to get there. And then I think uh, we can play uh, a major role in this uh, huge energy transition that Europe is undergoing at present. Thank you very much for your attention. Too quick. Very good. Um, molto bene. Mol so very good, very short. What important contents. We will uh, soon have the final report. About the work that we've been carried out with these um, firms in Europe.
Now, we are going to have a panel with um, leading companies in uh, methane mobility in Italy. So I would like Massimo Santori from CNH, CNH Industrial to come uh, to the podium, Elisa Boscherini from uh, FCA, and Simona D'Angelo Sante that works for SNAM Advocacy. Ecco. Bene, allora, mentre per, per iniziare questo, il vostro intervento eh, abbiamo proiettato eh, l'accordo. You can see the picture of the agreement signed by your companies at the Ministry of Economic Development. These are your CEOs for mobility with natural gas and methane. So by way of introduction, please present us the work that you have been carried out, not, not, not to present your company, but to talk about the work you have been doing within this uh, memorandum of understanding, so the contribution of your companies are given to the sector. Good morning. I represent FCA in November, October 2016. We have signed this MOU with the colleagues from Iveco and SNAM which marked an important uh, moment for our companies because it represented a strategic partnership for the promotion of methane and biomethane uh, at a national level. Our realities are, are, are multinational realities. We try to transpose the objectives of the carbonation imposed by Europe, but on the Italian market, we pay great attention to this uh, problem and we cooperate with all the stakeholders of the sector, the CIB in the first place, and the institutions. So the strategic partnership, as you've seen from the picture, um, was um, concluded at the Ministry of Economic uh, Development, was finalized at the Ministry for Economic Development. We also attended the G7 in Bologna, uh, sorry, the G7 uh, supported this partnership, the G7 for the environment. So in order to boost um, the use of methane and to make the methane market grow, uh, laying stress on the importance of methane in the um, activities to counter climate change and to encourage decarbonation. For more than 30 years, FCA has been investing in methane and believes that methane can be a priority solution for sustainability, which for us is not only environmental sustainability, is also sustainability in terms of costs, in terms of timing, because we need uh, timely solutions and solutions that are immediately accessible that can uh, meet the needs of uh, our users. And methane cuts fuel costs by 60%, allowing drivers to cover longer distances, 23% emission reduction, uh, um, PM uh, minimized to zero. It's an immediate response to the needs of uh, uh, the quality of air, especially in the Po Valley in northern Italy, in the solution to um, counter climate change. This is the overall strategy. Good morning. I deal with public affairs um, for CNH Industrial, which is the group including three of the brands you see represented there. So New Holland, Iveco and FPT Industrial. So everything that's the capital goods world, um, buses, uh, heavy transportation, machinery. 
We have learned a lot from this agreement with SNAM and FCA. And I would like to take the opportunity to publicly thank uh, my colleagues here because we are working very closely. We are promoting our relationships with institutions to promote methane and, above all, biomethane. I would like to um, um, thank um, the uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, the Ministry for Economic Development, and uh, all the stakeholders involved, associations, even the oil and gas companies that interact, uh, truck drivers, um, TPR companies, with whom we have created a true synergy, which is pretty rare in a country like Italy, to promote the use of natural gas. With respect to capital goods, heavy vehicles, um, um, uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, already compatible with the um, possibility of using bio-LNG. And this is the topic that we have been addressing in this conference. Many of you are interested in knowing something more about the potential demand for biogas that can be produced in your farms. Well, I think it's very important to understand what's the um, um, point of arrival of this uh, business. And uh, liquefied natural gas is growing. We um, just opened uh, the 15 LNG um, stations uh, along the A4 highway last year. Only three stations were working. Now we have 15. Iveco is a protagonist in, within the framework of a research project, uh, a research project focusing on a partnership um, based on the synergy I mentioned earlier with the Polytechnic University of Turin, the Ministry for Infrastructure and Transportation. Um, Connect to NG, this is the name of the project, is a project um, funded uh, at a European level that will allow us to build many uh, LNG stations compatible with bio-LNG all over Europe. So for us, the focus of our business is allowing uh, transportation uh, trucks mainly that need um, to cover long distances to be competitive and to be alternative to diesel. There's no alternative to diesel uh, apart from uh, LNG because the other solutions f do not allow to have the necessary autonomy and the necess necessary, necessary performance that the LNG technology can guarantee. Australis Iveco 460 HP can cover a distance of 1,600 kilometers with a double cryogenic tank with the same performance of a diesel engine, of a last generation diesel engine. So this is an option, a very interesting option for all the producers of biomethane that are all Dry, they're all engines that are currently, and I want to stress the word currently, available on the market. To um, conclude the um, part on, uh, on capital goods, the important agreement we signed with SNAM and FCA, the partnership with SNAM, SNAM is very important for buses. Think about methane and biomethane fueled buses in, uh, in, 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 in an urban environment. It's extremely important to contribute to the circular economy. So waste equals biomethane that can be used to fuel buses for transportation and at the same time enhance infrastructure and uh, the uh, uh, deposits so that uh, they can be fueled with methane and uh, public transportation uh, utilities can invest in building, uh, in, in buying a new fleet compatible with uh, bio CNG. It's a solution that is compatible with the environment, but is also cost efficient. This is a VECO philosophy. That is to say, making sustainability, environmental sustainability, sustainability can be compatible with economic sustainability. So, um, of course, this is their priority. They have very high on their agenda. Thank you very much. I'm um, um, Simona D'Angelo Sante. I'm from SNAM. SNAM needs no introduction. 
uh, manages infrastructure, as you know. We have and we manage infrastructure, mostly gas transportation facilities. We have a gasification plant as well, not far from La Spezia in Liguria. Gas arrives there uh, at a liquid state and they're uh, regasified. A couple of years ago, we thought about the following. We have infra the infrastructure. How can we make this infrastructure available to a decarbonation process? We said uh, earlier from uh, Kis van der Looy and from ECOFIS that the target of decarbonization, decarbonation always more and more challenging by 2030, by 2050. We have the infrastructure, so we asked ourselves the following question. How can we encourage this decarbonation process? How can we speed it up? Um, we started with uh, two pillars, gas mobility, and then the MOU with Diveco, CNH Industrial and FCA, and the biomethane pillar. SNAM signed a position uh, paper with CIB and with the Confagricultura. The two things are not going uh, ahead in parallel. These are two things that can uh, intertwine perfectly. Biomethane, once injected in our infrastructure, is treated like natural gas for all intents and purposes. And I would like to draw inspiration from what Marco Pizzaglia said in his presentation. Those who love maths probably will uh, be surprised by the comparison between Tartaglia's triangle and Pizzaglia's uh, triangle because Pezzalia's triangle, like Tartaglia's triangle, has no, there's not only three points. Tartaglia's triangle is infinite, basically. We're not getting there. But let's focus on biomethane. I will focus on three factors um, uh, and three points that are very important concepts. First of all, biomethane is uh, renewable. Biomethane is flexible. Biomethane, which is the most important for us, biomethane is um, uh, easy to be stored and uh, transported. So just like the tires triangle, the benefits of biomethane can be extended endlessly uh, without the fact that um, it is um, eco-friendly. It, which is fundamental in a decarbonation process. It is a solution that is efficient for the decarbonation of the transportation sector. And let me add also, drawing inspiration from uh, what uh, Professor Devdi said yesterday, is also the possibility of uh, reaching advanced biofuel and biofuel targets in the transportation sector. But let's go back to us. What's NAM doing within the framework of the MOU? We run infrastructure. That's everything we can do. Uh, so two years ago, we started a dedicated unit, Andrea Ricci is responsible for that unit. It's a unit that focuses on the development of infrastructure because in Italy, more than 1 million methane-fueled vehicles and more uh, than 1,000 methane stations, but there's room for other stations. So SNAM has decided to invest in this sector in agreement also with the oil companies and gas companies. Uh, at the end of 2017, um, SNAM signed uh, a framework agreement for SNAM, with SNAM for the development of infrastructure. Thank you very much. We are very patient because we have been uh, waiting this decree for a long time. We have been crossing fingers for a long time. We always repeat it will come. But let me say that if the path we have gone through over the years ended positively, it is the result of the commitment of pe the people that worked uh, to this end. So from Brussels to Rome, you really believed in this opportunity. Lisa, tell us something more about the light commercial vehicles. And maybe I will sound provocative, but it is um, vision. 
whereby there's an opposition between uh, fuel and methane, or electricity and methane. We think it's um, something that is uh, really synergetic. So we'd like to hear from you. What do you think about it? We are here today as FCA, but also with our brand, Fiat Professional, which is the brand that was born in 2007. We've been operating with this brand for the urban distribution of goods in an urban environment. So our vehicles from Doblo to Fiorino to Ducato. Ducato is, an, is, a, is a vehicle that is um, um, very, very popular because uh, it is used also for road homes. If you're professional, is a brand that has believed a lot in the development of methane. And uh, as our colleagues were saying, the development for the urban environment will be extremely important because um, the urban environment needs more than others to be decarbonized, to be cleaned from pollutants and because the urban environment is the place where more than 50% of the global population are living, so more than 80% of GDP. So McKinsey's data tell us that road transport will grow by 60%. And 8% is, is expected for the urban distribution of the last mile. So in this scenario, our brands, in particular Fiat Professional, are getting ready to this future and are working on the decarbonation of fuel, but also on the new business models on um, connectivity on board, because the combination of all these factors um, will help uh, distribution that is optimized, which has flows, uh, urban flows that can e more easily reach their targets. Many operators are working on the market. Other brands are investing a lot on methane and biomethane. This is part of the joint work we've been promoting. So trying to make people understand methane and biomethane are a relevant factor that can bring benefits to all the operators. As Massimo said earlier, win-win synergies were created where everyone obtained benefits. So there's um, great attention to be paid. Uh, usually we think of new vehicles, so environmental goals. Regard what's new, what the producers are going to produce and sell uh, by 2020 and by 2030. But there's one thing we have to bear in mind, especially in a country like ours, uh, whose fleet is amongst the oldest in Europe and the largest. Biomethane is a very important solution. And we are meeting on a regular basis with uh, local authorities and mayors uh, are paying great attention to this question. We have been meeting uh, many of them. So it's important to work to decarbonize the um, circulating fleet and biomethane is transparent so neutral, I mean, for the vehicles and for the grid, can be injected directly into the grid, is a very important response that can definitely help in this direction. Thank you very much. Um, so before I ask the next question, uh, I would like to remind you of when we first uh, went to Turin, we went to Turin for the first time to meet the CNH industrial group and I remember that then there was um, a group of people and uh, you talked about 
for the first time of your notion of energy dependent farm and it was really exciting for us because we were coming with our model of BDR, but then listening and from the words of our industrial group that was working on the idea of um, a farm that is independent from an energy standpoint, not just from environmental standpoint, but also in terms of financials, to look at the financials, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, we, we must make a profit. So getting back to that, because there are many farmers here, so I would like to ask you the developments of this uh, activity you are conducting and what are the new prospects or frontiers that you are going to propose in the short term. Well, thank you, Piero. You give me the opportunity to tell you that Chiagnac Industrial is a very important partner for environmental sustainability. We're talking about uh, gas, um, flores, um, LNG for um, lorries. We are the only one to produce an engine which is called Crossway for buses in cities and uh, non urban buses, which we launched uh, last month and then and can travel for 600 kilometers and therefore can play an important part not just in an urban environment but also for non urban services, transportation services. At, at, the regional level as well. And then within CNH, there is New Holland, which is another brand you might be familiar with, and New Holland wants to become a clean energy leader, even though it's already so in certain respects, thanks to this idea of farming 4.0, which is the idea of a micro-circular economy um, implementing the green economy policy, which the environment uh, ministry, and I'm happy that to hear that Mr. Galetti is going to conclude these works, is really focused on the G, uh, on the environment, and the G7 in Bologna was focused on promoting the green economy. We very much support this. We are convinced that this can be successful because we think of the revolution that may take place when uh, machines and tools that are used uh, within farms uh, can be powered with uh, uh, an energy source that comes from uh, agricultural production. Think about uh, agricultural waste and biomass. So from these sources you can obtain that BDR that can be sold outside for lorries, cars and buses, but can also be used uh, to feed uh, the tractors of the future. And we presented uh, at the end of 2017 on the occasion of the G7 uh, a second generation prototype of the new Holland T6 uh, tractor which has a Fiat power trainer engine, 179 horsepower. So we are talking about an engine that is fully capable of uh, operating within any farm. We are market leaders in this sense, and um, it's still a, a prototype, but second generation. So this means that it's about to enter the market. So the New Holland brand uh, range will include this. We're very proud about it because uh, it falls within a framework uh, um, and it tries to answer a need that uh, looks to the environment with great care without, however, forgetting also financial sustainability because we are aware we want to help our investors. We cannot promise things that are too expensive or ineffective. We want to make a proposal in favor of a technology that is actually in favor of the environment right from the start, uh, from the well to the wheel. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Simone, you were mentioning the position paper that we signed some years ago with Confagricoltura, the Agricultural Association. Um, which had to do with 8 billion uh, uh, at a goal of 8 billion in terms of strengthening the biomethan in Italy. So position papers and I'm use them have to be translated into practical solutions. So new distribution 
points, uh, models, etc. So this is what we hope for, uh, really, as sector members. Now, um, in your opinion, what are these expectations generating? So do you have an increase in interest, uh, this from your observatory because of course you do think, see things also in practical terms. Well, since we started adopting this new procedure, which is the expression of interest, which is something you can do also simply by getting onto our website, um, there is an area, um, a specific area that we have to to answer questions. So since we started this procedure, we received 500 expressions of interest. And if you followed my presentation in Ecomondo a few months ago, we were ju just at 400. I can't remember. Ecomondo was held in November. It's an exhibition. There were also the Christmas holidays. So 100 new expressions of interest compared with November is quite a lot. So we've got 500 at the moment. So there is an interest. This has been confirmed. But these uh, are requests for connection to the SNAM transportation network. I don't know how many expressions of interest have been received by distributors, but I am in touch with some of them and they too are receiving expressions of interest. So the topic of the, the uh, distributor Sorry, with reference to stations, gas stations, um, in the summer there is a slump in demand. Um, so we are trying to understand how to tackle this issue. As far as NAM is concerned, 500 expressions of interests were turned into some 80 contracts for um, connection to the grid through NE. Three new plants are would will probably be added to a new uh, to a plant on in Montello, biogas production plant, and there will also be others. But you know that it takes quite a long time, some 20 months on average. But it's still a consolation that some weeks ago I took part in a conference organized in Antwerp by various associations and in my exchanges with some German lorry drivers, well, also in Germany it takes 18 months, so it's not just us that we are so slow and late in connecting plants. And these are the timings and this is due mainly to the fact that uh, there are authorizations, etc. And then as far as engineering um, for oil, pipe, uh, sorry, gas my pipelines, well, they take up quite um, a bit of time. So what can we say? Out of these 500 expressions of interest, just 80 were sent into contract because the banks say that the product is not easily marketable, marketable, and they are waiting for this biomethane degree. And when the degree is passed, um, we will then have to manage all the requests we are going to get. And uh, out of these 500 expressions of interest, the 300 could potentially become uh, connection contracts because they are at a distance that is that makes it financially feasible so thank you um, uh, we hope to see you again soon you mentioned Ecomondo which is this um, uh, exhibition held in Rimini EAG Expo which is the Rimini based uh, um, fair organizer. So we hope we are, when next time we meet, uh, we're not going to talk about something that is to come in the future, but uh, I hope the next time we see each other, we can talk about things that have already been implemented. I wish to thank to President Maria Rosa Baroni, uh, the president of NGV Italy, and then Mr. Paolo Vettori, another president. So two close friends who over the years have allowed us to uh, better understand the world of natural gas and uh, natural gas-based transportation. And also wish to thank Anigas for their presence. Um, and they are too helping us in our relationship with uh, the various uh, gas stations. And this is another 
this is going to be another important topic for the future. So thank you again for being here and for your contributions. And now, with some delay, we are going to open up the buffet, our light lunch buffet, and we will try to get back on time, hoping that there are no other technical difficulties. Thank you very much.